Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Blue is the New White podcast. Today's guest is one hell of an entrepreneur. And actually, she knew that's what she wanted to do since she was a little kid. Danielle Putnam, president of the New Flat Rate, joins us today to talk all about her journey to get where she is today. From a long line of trade professionals, Danielle was no stranger to the world of work. Just after high school, she joined a company that took her to 25 different countries, leading their marketing efforts. Then she went to work with her dad at his home service business just before jetting off to Portland for school. She got involved with a startup, lived her dream of setting foot on the New York Stock Exchange, and then moved back again to help her dad with the business. That's when the new flat rate was born, a menu pricing system for home service contractors. Since then, she has begun to offer Freedom Builders a ride-along and coaching program. She got involved with trade jobs to help fill the skilled trades gap, which launches this October, and also sits on the advisory board for women in HVACR. This is on top of being a mother of four. So listen, tune in to hear all about Danielle's story. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel and on our website at bluesthenewwhite.com to receive all the latest updates. You can now find this podcast on iHeartRadio, SiriusXM, and Pandora. As always, we rely on word of mouth from our listeners to further the mission. So if you enjoy this episode, please take a second to rate it, review it, and share it. The future generations of tradespeople depend on it. They depend on you. So thank you again and enjoy this episode of the Blue is the New White podcast with Danielle Putnam. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Blue is the New White podcast. I've got an awesome guest for you today. I was just getting to know her a little bit before the show as I like to do with all of my guests, but please welcome Danielle Putnam to the show and uh, I, I'd say give her a round of applause, but I can't hear you and neither can she. So... Uh, Danielle, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, let our audience know who you are, where you came from, and kind of how you got to where you are today. Oh, awesome. Josh, thanks so much for the introduction. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm happy to be here today. Well, my name is Danielle Putnam, and I am the president of a company called The New Flat Rate. And why that is so cool is because The New Flat Rate is the number one price generating software company for home service providers. I'm really proud of that. And I love that that's what I do and that I can actually tell you that. Um, but I'm ultimately a serial entrepreneur. I'm an advisory board member for women in HVACR. So I'm very involved in the heart of what's going on in the trades in the industry in trying to help recruit and promote jobs in the trades. I love to write about, to talk about how we can find and retain quality talent you know, for all of us, especially home service providers, I'm real passionate about it. And uh, I'm, I'm a mom of four. So I love to talk about that. The whole work life balance, I could talk about that all day long, <laughs> because it's like a constant ever chasing pursuit. Um, but back in the day, when I was, I guess, growing up my whole life, I come from a family line of contractors, my dad's a contractor, my brothers, my uncles, my grandfather. And so it was just life for us right? They, my family's always been in the trades and very mechanically inclined. And so we just assume that everybody can fix things like our family can <laughs> and by our family, you know, not, not necessarily me, but my family is really good at fixing things, all kinds of things, um, not just HVAC systems and electrical systems, but other uh, fix it people. And so I grew up with that mentality and always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I worked in the home service businesses, uh, you know, of, of my dad's when I was a kid ran parts, worked in the, the warehouse and inventory. And, I want to stop you for a second, um, if you don't mind. Ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Why did you want to be an entrepreneur? And I, I, I'm curious, I'm asking this question oh. because uh, I get, number one, wildly different answers from everybody. And number two, um, it's a very, it's a, it's a topic that I think many people are interested in. So I'm just curious, what made you want to be an entrepreneur? Gosh, as young, like, I always knew I wanted to be in business. I probably didn't know the word entrepreneur. <laughs> I knew business lady, right? Yeah. I wanted a flip phone. I wanted to wear high heels. I wanted to wear suits. I wanted to drive a nice car. And uh, I, I wanted to be in business. But I will tell you, Josh, it's because the fix it part 
of my DNA, I wanted to be involved in every facet of a business. Like I didn't want to just work for somebody in one lane. I wanted to know how the whole company worked. And the only way to do that, that I thought was to run the company. And so I wanted to be an entrepreneur because I wanted to build businesses and I'm a builder. I like to take something from whether it's from scratch and make it better or something that's existing. And how can we take that to the next level? And I love to think about it and I can't help but to think about it, right? The wheels are always turning. And then when you see something, you see a billboard or you see a piece of, you know, artwork, graphic, marketing, or, or a tool or a glass, right? We're always like, mm, that could have been done this way. And so <laughs> I love that you asked the question. I, I guess I've never really thought about that, but it's because That's I great. wanted to be involved in every piece of the business and I, love that I had answer. to be able to be at the top. I love that. I love that answer. And that is definitely something you get with entrepreneurship is involved in every tiny little corner of the business. (laughs) So it sounds like you got what you bargained for. (laughs) We get to sit in the seat, right? In all different phases. That's right. All right. Go ahead. uh, Go ahead with your story. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's such a good question. Well, so, you know, grew up in, in the office also, you know, for my dad's company. And then after I graduated, high school at 18, I moved out to Texas and I went to Bible school for four years. It was really not necessarily, I call it Bible school because then people, you know, feel like they know what that is, but it was more of a missions organization. We took teens on trips all around the, the world. And so I've been to over 25 countries and we did a lot of just really unique mission work wow. all over the world, you know, where we would um, help take care of people. Right. And it was just really, really fun. But I did that for four years after high school. I want to stop you again. I'm sorry. What'd you learn from that? Oh, I'm, you had to ask because I was like going rabbit trail. (laughs) But what I learned is while I was there, it was a large organization. I ran, uh, I worked in the marketing department. Oh. And so that's where I learned marketing. Awesome. Right. So what was crazy is this organization, it was like a $35 million organization. And so it was large, but it was ran by 18 year olds. They had about 800 teenagers come and do internships there. So here we are all out of high, are all out of high school. And I was one of the very few of my peers that had any work experience. And that is something I do love about the trades is they're, they're often family oriented enough that the children in the family get to know a lot about working before their peers do because mom and dad aren't just going to the office and then coming home at the end of the day. Instead, it's like, Hey, I got to run by this job site. Come with me or Hey, go to dad's office or mom's office because you can be involved. Right. Uh, Maybe the kids are actually doing some of the, you know, stocking things in the warehouse or stuffing mailers. So because I had the word marketing on my resume, because I'd sent out some postcards for my dad, I got a higher level job than my peers did in this organization. So I was running multi-million dollar marketing campaigns as an 18 year old. And also I worked on the donor side and I helped organize these large donor banquets for their multi-million dollar donors. And so we'd have these events, these donor banquets. And I mean, one time we invited president George Bush there. And so I just want to, you're like, don't talk politics. What I mean is (laughs) we, we were like mailing him presents to get his interest in our events. And as an 18, 19, 20, 21 year old, those are experiences that other people my age didn't have. Yeah. My friends that just went straight to college. That's awesome. I got to ask, did he reply? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? A for effort though. People you know? <laughs> did. <His> people did. <laughs> no, that's, that's really cool. And that's, that's actually, that's really amazing. You know, uh, right out of high school doing that for four years I haven't even asked you about college yet, but uh, I'm going to let you continue with your story. But I think that, you know, from a work experience and life experience standpoint, that's that's really amazing that you were mm-hmm. able to have, you know, that type of uh, uh, that type of I'm going to call it education. Right. And right. And uh, especially with regard to what you wanted to do, what you knew you wanted to do the mm-hmm. rest of your life in business. So that that's awesome. OK, great. I'm, I'm glad I asked. So what yeah. next? Yeah, I I love that season of life and I think of it so fondly. So then after that, my dad, who was running this contracting company, he called and said, you know, hey, you're going to stay out there forever or will you come back and help me with my business? And when dad calls, you know, so many of us in the trades are family oriented. And I I thought, well, I got to go help. And so I moved back to Georgia and he had 
been running a very large uh, you know, residential service company, heating and air electrical and plumbing. And at this time, he'd downsized. He'd sold the plumbing and electrical and moved back into the basement of the house with just his HVAC business, trying to figure out how to run a profitable business. It was feast or famine, very difficult to run. And so he was trying to figure that out. And, and so I moved back and worked in the basement that year, trying to organize things, doing some marketing. But a year later, I was like, okay, I'm out. You guys keep rocking and rolling. And, and so I left and I went to Portland, Oregon, because to be honest, this is like, I did, I did start college. I started college here in Georgia at the little community school and I wasn't so hot at the math. And so, uh, you know, I wasn't really doing the best and getting the best grades. And so I'm looking at colleges that didn't have that math class. And I find one in Portland, Oregon. I was like, okay, good. I can go there and I can skip that math class because I wanted to do a business <laughs> degree, right? And so I, I can't, I'll never forget telling my parents, I'm going to move across the country to a place I've never been. And they're like, what? So I, I did though. I got in my car and I got out there and for two months I was starving. I didn't have, you know, I maybe had $1,200, maybe $2,000 when I moved out there. And, you know, it was the highest unemployment place in the nation at the time. But I was like, oh, I can do this. So in downtown Portland, which was beautiful at the time, I love Portland. I go and I look at the highest, the tallest sky rise. And I'm like, I'm going to work there. So I walked in the building and I get on the elevator and I push a button and I go all the way up and I just walk off and start walking around. <laughs> People are looking at me like, who is this crazy kid? And I was like, well, I, you know, I'm here looking for a job and just started passing out my resume and nobody hired me. So two months later, I'm still starving. And my dad calls and says, do you need some help? I'm like, yes, I do. I'm starving. So he, he says, Hey, call this guy, call Charlie Greer, call Charlie Greer and tell him that you're Rodney's daughter. Tell him that I sent you and see if he knows anybody in Portland that can give you a job. So if Charlie um, is, a, is a trainer, was a trainer before he retired, you know, in, in the industry. So I call him up and I'm like, Hey, Charlie, I'm Rodney's daughter. I'm in Portland, Oregon, I'm looking for a job. Do you know anybody? He's like, Oh yeah. He goes through his Rolodex, gives me the name of three contractors. So I call him up, go out to lunch with them. And they hired me as their marketing director. The first one did. <laughs> and so out there, I was so thankful because I had this network. All of a sudden I had a job working in the trades, doing marketing for a company. And I had the best time with them that year. So I can pause for a minute. Otherwise I'll just keep talking forever. No, that's okay. <laughs> So you moved to Portland to avoid math. I got that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that's an incredible story um, up to this point even. And, and okay, so you, you you got back involved in marketing. So it seems like there's a little bit of a pattern here so far, mm -hmm. you know, heavy in the, on the marketing side. Um, how did your dad have those contacts in, in all the way in Portland? Was he a well-connected guy as well just through the industry, through the, his, his business in the industry? So good question. He was connected, well connected from, from trade shows, from conferences, sure. right? You go to these events and you meet fellow contractors that are all over. But Charlie Greer, the consultant and coach and trainer, is the one my dad's like, hey, call Charlie, who was yep. in Florida. And Charlie had the Rolodex of contractors oh, all over. Got it. So Charlie wasn't in Portland. Charlie was in right. Florida, but he had the yeah. contacts in Portland. That's right. Got it. I understand. So, yeah. Okay, He's cool. like, tell him Charlie sent me or sent you. I was like, okay. <laughs> and then while you were doing this and when you got hired, were you still in school? So I dropped out of Portland State University because I was, I was out of state and I could only take so many classes and entrepreneurs are often impatient. I was like, I can't do this forever. Uh -huh. So I jumped, <laughs> I jumped online. I ended up graduating from Colorado Technical University in, with a business degree in marketing. Oh, okay. Great. Well, up until that po point, you still had more college experience under your belt than me. So you got something to, <laughs> it didn't, it didn't do me anything. Don't worry. It didn't do me. Anything. You know what? I mean, honestly, if you've heard a couple episodes of the show, you've, you've probably heard me talk a little bit about this in the past. And my listeners certainly know, right. And, and college is, is, is good for certain people and certain things, you know, but it's all about the ROI. And I'm a mm -hmm. big advocate for if that ROI isn't there, then mm -hmm. uh, neither should your college application be. <laughs> yeah, I definitely fell in the trap of the peer pressure feeling like that's what I was supposed to do. And my parents were not on board with it by any means, right? They didn't understand why I needed that. They weren't. Um, but I did I did feel fall, fall into the peer pressure. And because of that, I had the big bills. Yeah. And it took years yeah. to pay it off. I bet. You know, it's that's interesting. That's not a... Uh, 
that's not an angle that I usually hear on this show. Usually it's the parents that are, you know, mm -hmm. saying, hey, do this. But I guess that makes sense with your parents, you know, being in the trades. They already saw mm -hmm. the value of, you know, uh, going straight into the workforce and, and stuff like that. However, your peers, though, are the ones that say, you got to do this. You got to do this. <laughs> Isn't that right? I do. And, you know, my parents love me and I've got great parents and I, I love them. So I say this with all respect. But the day that they said to me, Danielle, you're not cut out for college, <laughs> I kind of took that as an insult. <laughs> and it was maybe more of a, I'll show you. There it's you probably okay. why I went to college. <laughs> okay. Sometimes that pans out and some, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes but you know what? Yeah. Honestly, you know, and you look at the butterfly effect and everything else, um, the experiences that uh, are in your past ultimately in one way, shape, or form led you to where you are today. You know, I'm a firm believer of, of that. So, yeah. uh, so I think that, uh, you know, that being said, let's, let's continue on and, and uh, see where this leads us. Cool. From there, I ended up in California. I lived in Southern California for five and a half years. Oh, what part? And worked, or, well, Orange County. So I lived in Fullerton and I worked in Newport Beach. And I was employee number two at a startup. And this startup was right around the time that Facebook was breaking out from because when Facebook started, it was just for college students. Mm -hmm. And around this time, this is around 2005, it was becoming open to the public. And so this was a digital services software company that I was employee number two at. We went public in 2007. And so I was able to fly all over the U.S. with the CEO and pitch to stockbrokers and investors and venture capitalists. And one of the highlights of my career is definitely the memory of being able to walk on the trading floor of the New York City Stock Exchange. It was just the most surreal, surreal feeling. Like it was just yeah. awesome. I was like, oh my gosh. And then that same day, we are in a high rise in New York City watching the snow fall outside of the boardroom. And I'm like, I feel like Matthew McConaughey in an awesome <laughs> movie, right? Like I just felt like this awesome, awesome person up high and I was a kid really. Uh, wow. But that was so fun. So we um, worked really hard growing that business and I learned so much about startup life, startup culture, and how to run a successful business from that season. And my boss, his name was Mike Sautel. I will always be thankful to him for that season of training. He really took me as his apprentice and taught me everything. He's like, right now we're playing the float. Right now, let's talk about our EBITDA. Right now, let's do this. And I learned that from him. Um, if you can have a mentor that takes you in like that, uh, there's nothing as, as valuable in your career to me as that was. And so that was five and a half years in we were getting bought out by a large company traded on NASDAQ because we'd been a penny stock company. And I was going to go with the merger to the new company and had a great position secured. I was making a lot of money. I was single. I was in Southern California. I was having the time of my life. But my dad kept calling with ideas. And he'd finally stumbled on something that he thought would help his contracting company work. He's like, I've got this this idea, I've found the pattern, I know how to run a profitable service business now, and I need your help. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I thought about it. And then finally, I'll never forget one night he calls me in the evening. He's like, Danielle, I can't do it without you. I need you to help me do this business. And if you'll move home, I'll name you president and I'll pay you $75,000 and you can run the company and help me build it. And I said, well, first of all, if I'm president, I'll name my own salary. <laughs> and yes, I'll come home. <laughs> but Josh, the reason I said that was because I knew there wasn't any money and I was the daughter and I wasn't going to let my dad mortgage his house, yeah. refinance his house a third time. And so I knew I was going to go home and work for nothing. So I said my goodbyes to California, came back to Dalton, Georgia, and maxed out all my credit cards and blew through all my savings that year as we built the new flat rate. And it took that year. So after that, by 2012, we were rocking and rolling. It's like, oh my gosh, we did this. So, and, you know, a lot so of when you moved back, ahead. that was that was 2011 when you moved back and then finally got it, it rolling again in 2012? Correct. Okay. It took a year to build. All right. All right, go ahead. So when I look back, and, you know, a lot of your listeners probably already have established businesses, but if they don't, and if they're considering starting a business, in the home services uh, or anything, right? Um, something that was so, so, so key is the list. And it's easy to forget this 12 years later, but when you have an idea and you start a business, you have to have that first list. Who are you going to tell first? 
about this product or service. And if you don't have that list, all of a sudden you spend all this time and all your all your savings and all your golden eggs and you have nobody to tell and nobody to buy. So we got uh, very, you know, I don't even know if it's lucky, but the best part of, of our list is my dad had had all these connections for years and years and years. And so he says, when we had the product, he says, hey, that computer over there at that old desk in his garage, I think it still turns on. If you can get that old computer to turn on and find my old email system in there, I should have a lot of email addresses of contractors I've been emailing with over the years. <laughs> and this is back then, right? I'm like, okay, great. So I spent, I can't even tell you how much time scouring his old email, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, building the list. Wow. Well, sounds like your uh, marketing senses just kicked right back into gear. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that and I think that's really powerful. And I want to, I want to just reiterate one more time for the listeners the importance of this list, right? And and how you put mm -hmm. it is, who are you going to tell first? I think that's a really, really powerful statement and one that hasn't been made on this show before. You know, uh, after 152 episodes, so thank you, Danielle. Yay! You know, <laughs> who are you going to tell first? And that that's important because you could you could have the best product, yeah. the best service, the best anything in the world, but if you have nobody to tell. You don't have a business. Yeah, right. And you got to start building that right away. And even before you even start building your product or your service, every business card, you know, all of that, stick it in your pocket, save it. There you Keep go. Your list always. And, and that's just a network. That, that's the second powerful statement, right? Is that if you're not yet in a position to launch or release a product or service, continue to network. What do they say? Mm -hmm. your, your network is your net worth. Right. That's, a, is, that's, right? A, yeah. that's a buzz. That's a buzz line. Right. Yeah. But, you know, there's a lot of truth to it. And uh, largely, you know, I've I've uh, I've built my company the same way, too. You know, always, like you said, you take that business card, you stick it in your pocket. And, mm -hmm. you know, sooner or later, you've got a Rolodex of people that you can call. And, you know, even better if you can maintain a relationship with them and, you know, just pick up the phone every once in a while and say, hey, how's it yeah. going, man? We met here and here, you know, just wanted to check in, see how you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's power. Yeah. There's power in that. There is. All right, good. So, all right. So, so in 2012, you started to, to get rolling. And this is kind of the inception of the new flat rate. Is that right? This, this mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of cresting into that right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. So 2011, we were beta testing Sure. and it was Jay Abraham and you may know Jay, he's considered the number one marketing consultant coach in the world. And at that time, it was a misunderstanding. He had thought that my dad had sold his HVAC business or one of, one of his service businesses for like 20 million plus dollars, which wasn't true, but because he thought that maybe my dad was saying something like, you know, the market is worth this or something. I don't know. But because he thought that. My dad was selected to be part of this very small tribe that Jay Abraham was coaching. And so he invited this small group, this tribe to his place in California once a month for I think 18 months. And uh, so my dad would travel out there as we're starting the new flat rate. And so my dad's like talking about this new business. Jay's like, wait a minute, new business? What are you talking about? So we, we got you know very fortunate there that we were in on that. And so every month when he'd travel out there, he'd be like, okay, here's where we are in our business. We've built a product or we're doing this and we're doing that. And Jay's like, no, 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 no. Have you tested? Do you have feedback? Have you beta tested? So he taught us how to run a controlled beta test, how to A, invite people to be a part of the test and then how to accumulate the data so that you can course correct and simplify and clarify along the way. And that was very, very, very important for us at the time. So 2011, we're running a beta. We asked contractors, we got this new price book. We don't know if it'll work but it's a menu, it's five different options so that you can present to your customers in the home more than one price. Will you take a look at it? Will you be willing to try it? And so we had contractors, small, large, all different kinds of demographics, test it for us. And every Friday they would report back what was happening. And what we found was the average service ticket was going up by $246 without the technicians even saying anything. Oh. And that was a big deal. $246 per service ticket, right? Oh. Uh, just by presenting a menu page. Unbelievable. So and we all, and these pages back then, we had this three ring binder with some laminated pages of the, I don't know, 15 or 20 of the most common 
service calls that my five-year-old brother had ran through the laminator, <laughs> right? So they weren't, they weren't fancy. They weren't pretty. It was, here's what we've got. Can you try it? And instantly they all report back success. Wow. That's when we really knew, hey, we have something. And back then, you know, you can't even say the word scale. How do we scale? I mean, scale is not the word to say back then. It's like, how do we, how do we get more people to try it? How do we build it to the next level? How do we start creating something bigger? Yeah. And how did you, what did you, what did you, what did you do next? Cause let's, let's actually pause for a moment and can you kind of give us a glimpse? This was, this was 2012, right? Can you give us a glimpse into let's fast forward. Let's let's talk a little bit about, you know, where where you're at today. All right. I don't I don't need the whole, you know, A to B to C to D, right? I just I want to know kind of high level what what are we looking at? What are we talking about? Where's where's the impact here? What what are you guys doing today? Of course we expanded. We started with HVAC and now we have HVAC, plumbing, electrical, indoor air quality, chimney. Wow. And we're, we're an app, of course, and it's a, it's a pricing system. It's a pricing tool that offers options that automatically helps the homeowner to upsell, to remove the technician's pressure to sell and become a great salesperson. But looking into the future and where we are today, not only do we have all of this data for what works, but I'm so excited that we still have like barely hit the tip of the iceberg, right? It's like we think about, hey, should we go into pest control and garage doors and all this stuff? And can we? Yes, but it's like we're doing really cool things in this niche market. We, by osmosis, organically added on a lot of ride-alongs, a lot of training and coaching. We have a coaching group called Freedom Builders University where we do process development. We write processes. And so looking into the future, we love working alongside home service providers and contractors to, it's not about getting them unstuck, but it's how do we systematize their business so that they can have freedom in their business, whether they want to be an absentee owner, or maybe they would just want to work part-time. Maybe, you know, they want to grow to the next level. And so we're able to, to do that. But I'm really excited with the advances that are coming in the app. Last year, my um, my my chief technology guy, the guy that was, that was running all of our, our technology development, he was an entrepreneur as well. And so he left to go and, and create his own business. And when he did, I was going on maternity leave and I was like, holy heck, right? Like I'm a software company, development company. What, what's going to happen? I don't have anybody running my teams. I'm going to be gone for two months. And so it forced me to step into that role. And so when somebody leaves, you can feel like your whole company, especially a key player, you feel like your whole company is going to collapse, but it's often the very best thing for you. And for me, it was the very best thing because it forced me to get close to the product again and to listen to my customers again, because it's very easy 12 years in to get removed from your customers as well. You have a lot more insulation between you and the front lines. You don't know what they're saying to your technicians and your people all the time if you're not out in the field doing ride alongs. And so I had all this insulation and I didn't realize all the advances that we needed. And so this past year I've been running the dev teams along with my director of operations. I'm going to give some credit to Cynthia. <laughs> Cynthia and I sat in the seat together. I'm like, I can't put it on you. You don't know how and I don't know how, so let's figure it out. And so we've been meeting with the dev teams and learned Josh that anything is, is possible. And so, no, we can't let anybody say no. Instead, it's like, we'll draw a picture and we want this. And so now I'm so excited because all the customization that's coming for contractors, like I'm on a job right now, I've got my five options, but I want to just plop in this or I want to plop in that. Like it's all in beta testing now. And so this, I know this is kind of like, a, I'm just like talking. No, and no, 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 like that's all right. there I'm, everywhere. I'm taking it but all in and I'll ask questions. I'm so <laughs> excited because of you know, within, I don't know, one, two months from now, contractors are going to have so much more power on their iPad, on their phone, in the field of being able to really price services that have been out of the scope in the past and not from scratch. So it's not only done for them, it's just going to be so much easier. So my business takeaway from this, though, if I could sum it up a little bit better, is that when you have, when you feel held hostage by a team member and you feel like, hey, if that person walks out, I, you know, my company is going to really suffer. Sometimes it's the best thing 
for you to learn that position. And you're not going to sit in it forever, but that way you can reconnect with your customer again and find out what they really want. Otherwise, we're developing things that we thought of in a boardroom that mean what to nobody. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's really powerful too. And it's a, it's a nice reminder to business owners that have grown their businesses, right? And, and um, mm-hmm. naturally, to your point, as you grow a business as an owner, you know, you separate yourself from every position that you once used to sit in. And that does so sometimes create a disconnect. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've experienced this myself, right? And, and it takes getting back to it in, in sometimes in the, in the most primal capacity, right? And I, I mm-hmm. use that word because that's what, you know, kind of just how, how you started, right? Like every once in a while, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I like to, to ride with one of my technicians, right? I'm not in the field the anymore, best. but I started yeah. in the field, right? And, and yeah. so to, to kind of center yourself and go all the way back to the beginning, knowing now what you, what you know, right, through mm-hmm. your travels, it gives you an entirely different perspective. And I don't know about you, but every time I sit in another seat and every time I do it, even if I do it in the same seat, you know, a couple of years later, I feel like I learned something new, you know, and, yes. I, and, mm-hmm. and that learning experience helps to push and grow mm-hmm. the company the way that it needs mm-hmm. to be. Um, so I'm curious right now, like how, how, how big is, is the new flat rate? How many companies do you, um, do you provide this service for? Yeah, well, we're in all 50 states and four provinces of Canada. So we have a lot of companies and we have a lot of a lot of users, a lot of technicians, right? We have integrations with Service Titan and with House Call Pro. And we're, we've got a lineup of ones that we're working on. We're working on one right now with Optimus Financing. And that'll be really cool too. And it's, that's a perfect relationship because they um, have a, a great product, but they need a platform for contractors to be able to showcase the options. And so that's going to be just a beautiful partnership that we're working on. And all of that just helps us to expand and reach more. Yeah. So, so talk to me a little bit about this freedom builders and, and kind of how this came about and, uh, and what you do with that. You had mentioned, you know, organically getting into ride alongs and, and coaching, you know, which I think mm-hmm. is actually kind of funny and serendipitous, right? Because of all the coaching that you got from Jay Abraham, maybe, you know, yeah, uh, it's, it's totally kind of uh, an interesting transition there. So yeah. when did that, I, I am curious how that sparked, like at what point were you like, Hey, you know, this sounds like a good idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Customers asked, right. And so in 2012, somebody said, Hey, if we buy this new pricing system, can you come to our location and help train our guys? So of course the answer is going to be yes. We didn't know what that was going to look like. So we said yes, and then you kind of build the parachute on the way out of the plane sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Right? Oh, wow. You so know, lately, it, was, <laughs> it was all the way back in 2012. When, when st- we started our first ride along. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So just, the, I guess it was probably four or five years ago we started Freedom Builders University because we noticed this need, kind of like a CEO track, right? We've got service manager training and you have CSR training and technician and craftsmanship training. But it's like we noticed this, this void, the CEO track, the CEO, the management team needed help building processes in their business. There's these large hundred million dollar companies that their process ran and they're, you know, they're so far away from the smaller 500,000, 1 million, $2 million shops. So to, to fill that gap, we launched Freedom Builders University and it is, it is a process writing workshop program. We get together every quarter and we either meet at a contractor's location. It's fun to go on site and see how other people run their businesses, right? And so we'll write processes together for a couple of days and do business, high level business training as well. And then we have an annual mastermind where we'll go and we'll stay together. This past year it was in Gatlinburg and we stayed in you know one of those big, beautiful luxury cabins where everybody's there. And so you mastermind and you've seen the pictures of places like that, right? Where, or you've maybe been, you mastermind on the deck and in the kitchen and in the living room and all over the place and you're constantly working on your businesses together. And so that is more of the spirit of this group. We've got just incredible people that, and all different levels, so willing to freely share where they're at and what's working for them in their business with everybody else. That the program, we, you know, Josh, we just haven't done the best of the job to let the world know that it's available. Um, But for those that are in it, we're just a real tight knit group 
that um, our, our building processes and developing our companies together. It's been neat. Wow. No, and that sounds wildly valuable too. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. the the support system, right, that I, I imagine the owners get, you know, by being part of this is mm-hmm. is just valuable in itself, right? I mean, we, we started this off talking about networking, right? And, yeah. And, yeah. and how important that is. And, and especially now you've created almost, I'm going to call it a community, right? Mm-hmm. Of, of like-minded individuals all working towards a very similar, I would imagine, goal, mm-hmm. you know, in, in uh, parallel industries. <laughs> so it's, yeah. that's, that's incredible. And, and I, I think that that is for that to come organically, right? It means that it means that you, you guys, you specifically were really paying attention, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, because uh, as business owners, you know, we have to, and I think this is probably a, a gift of, of most entrepreneurs, right? Is being able to see the value in things, being able to see the void, if you will, and, and how you can work to fill that void. And I think it's incredible that, you know, you have it almost just systematically filled these voids in the skilled trades through your journey. Um, it's just all very, it's all very linear. <laughs> I, I like oh, the way yeah, that neat. it Thank all you. unfolded. So no, that's, that's really great. Um, what am I not asking? What, uh, what else is out there that, that you're working on or that you have visions with? Um, you know, what, what is there tomorrow for, the new flat rate. You know, it's really important to us to help cash flow. So we've got to get cash flow coming in for these home service businesses. It's so the future is we have to let everybody know that you, it should not be a struggle. You should not have the feast and famine. And so first things first is we want to work with companies to get their cash flow going so then they can make decisions from a position of strength. And then let's take a look at their marketing. And then let's take a look at their team. And then let's take a look at their legacy and where they're going. And so the future of the new flat rate is those pillars are still true today. So we're building upon those and trying to get the word out even more to bring more people into this into this family, right, of of contractors, this network of us doing it together. Very cool. So before we even hit the record button, right, uh, we, we were talking a little bit about the show and you had mentioned something that I wanted to make sure I touched on. Uh, I think you called it trade jobs. Is that what it yes. was? I want to yes. talk a little bit about this. I'm so glad you mentioned it. So Josh, have you ever heard anybody say, hey, I can't find any technicians? No, never. I've never heard that in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> right? it's, it's the number one, the number one complaint that I feel like most everybody could agree on that we all hear is that we can't find or retain high quality technicians or people in the trades and the skilled yeah. trades. It's so difficult to find people. And it's not just home service providers, you know, um, HVAC electrical plumbing, uh, also in the flooring. Right now I live in the yeah. flooring capital of the world in Dalton, Georgia, all the flooring uh, manufacturers here say they can't find flooring installers. And so it is skilled trades, skilled workers everywhere. We all know that there's a problem. And so I've recently partnered with trade jobs. It's, um, a new movement and it's launching October, I, I think October 1st, but really finally just deciding a group of us are getting together saying, you know what, we're tired of hearing the complaints because by now it's just whining. And since we all know what's a problem, can we get together and be a part of the solution? And then can we be founding members and pat ourselves on the back? And I mean this in like the best of ways to be like, yeah, there was a problem. We fixed it. We solved it. Done. What's next? Right. <laughs> and, and, and really, so I'm a part of the movement to end this crisis of um, matching skilled tradespeople with their employers. And so Trade Jobs is going to be launching in October to do that. And I'd love if anybody's interested in learning more about it, please shoot me an email. And at the end of the show, I'll, I'll say my email so that I can help get you in touch so you can be a part of it. Yeah. No, I'm definitely interested in that as well. That's yes. that's right up my alley. <laughs> no, that, That's really cool. Yeah, we all got to fix it. We got to fix it together. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, that's exactly right. Like I said this, I've said this a thousand times on the show, right? But all ships rise with the tide, right? Mm-hmm. You cannot... 
it, right now we have what I call a revolving door in the industry, right? Mm -hmm. You know, technicians, uh, especially, you know, uh, I think the ratio is what for every five, I think that's up to seven now for every seven technicians that leave the industry, one comes in, you know, but what we're seeing from a retention standpoint is mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, the, the market wages for technicians are, are going up and up and up, which, you know, ultimately, yeah. listen, I get mm -hmm. it and, and it's good, but, but there's, it, it it's almost a um, self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because one technician will go from one company to another company for a little bit more money mm -hmm. to another mm -hmm. company for a little bit more money. Mm -hmm. And eventually it'll do this full circle thing. And next thing you know, it yeah. are, you know, market rates for technicians are up to here. You know, yeah. and how do we combat that as business owners? We raise our prices, right, to the consumer. Mm -hmm. So the consumer mm -hmm. prices go up. And like I said, it's this this self-fulfilling prophecy. So uh, the solution is to get more people in the industry, you know, mm -hmm. which which still provides several different opportunities, several opportunities for people coming in. Um, and that's not going to change for a very, very long time. So right. I, I really love the direction of... Uh, of of that movement, mm -hmm. that's that's fantastic. Yeah, I'm excited about it. And then I always love to plug women in HVACR. I was it's just a about to organization. Just about yeah, to can't, ask. Yeah, can't help it. No, uh, women in or HVACR. Uh, it's an organization, it's a network of women in manufacturing, distributing, business services, um, contracting, commercial, residential, and uh, all different kinds. And our annual conference is coming up in Jacksonville, Florida, in November, November fifth through eighth. And it sells out. I know we'll have over 300 women there this year. We have over 70 uh, vendors for the expo. It's it's gotten really big, but That's it sells cool. out every year. But it's just awesome. So I love to plug that organization. They do a lot of scholarships and mentoring, which is great. And hey, the EGIA Foundation, I recently joined their board too. Uh, they've got a great scholarship program. Yeah, EGIA. And it's important I, for uh, people to know. Yeah. The, um... I think the marketing director for them was on the on the show uh, last year around this time. Cool, cool. Yeah, I, it's so important for people bringing them into the trades, knowing that there's so many scholarships available and not many people applying for them. So the odds are in their favor. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and and Cefesa is another one that's not uh, super known, but that's the Commercial Food Equipment Service Association. They've got scholarships cool. available as well uh you know and there's like to your point there's so many different yeah. you know avenues to get into the skilled trades that people have no idea about so i'm glad you're talking about it you know and another point to to uh, women in hvacr which is a, an incredible organization you know we talk right everybody talks about how we can't find technicians we can't find technicians yeah. yet we are pretty much as a whole kind of disregarding half of the world population <laughs> as viable candidates, right? Which is yeah. what, which is the work that yeah. women in HVACR uh, aim to to do, right? Is to be able mm -hmm. to close that gap and, and get more mm -hmm. women into into these trade industries and, and organizations. Mm -hmm. That's um, right. Which, I mean, we're, we're gaining ground, I believe, but nowhere mm -hmm. near yeah. where we can be. Right. And it's just a great solution. Oh, absolutely. 100%. All right. We're running out of time here. I can't believe I, there's just so much to talk about with you. I, <laughs> I, I can't believe we've been talking as long as we have. And I feel like we could just keep going. But in the effort to keep my audience's attention, yeah, I'm talking to you guys out there. Um, I want to uh, move to wrap this up. But I've got one more question for you that I like to ask everyone on the show. Um, we talk a lot about success on the Blue is the New White podcast, right? We talk about how, you know, kind of as a whole, we're pushed into uh, somebody else's version of success, right? We all try to fit in this neat little box of what success looks like. You know, go to school, get a degree, buy a house, have a good job, you know, all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. But success looks different to everybody, and I think that that's something that we have to keep in mind. And what I like to do is I like to ask all my guests how you define success and how the trades as a whole, from your perspective, is helping you achieve that success. Yeah, success is freedom to do what you want, when you want, people say. But mine's more niche than that. Mine's when my kids say, Mom, will you jump on the trampoline with me? And I can say yes. Success is spending time with my kids anytime they ask. And the trades have provided that. 
the flexibility. It's in the trades. We don't have to be a slave to a desk. We can work out in the field, anywhere, anytime, be flexible. And and I love that. And right now I am also the cross country coach for my eight year old. <laughs> of course you are. Why wouldn't you be? You're like eighteen <laughs> different things on here. You gotta add one more. <laughs> We're, we're running tonight and it's 103 and we are running. My team is running tonight. Um, oh my but, but that is success. That is success for me is to be able to, to build up wonderful, confident, strong humans. And I'm so proud to be able to spend time with them. And it's because of the trades that I can. No, I love that. And I think that's a really, uh, pointed and honest and transparent answer. And, uh, I think it resonates with a, a ton of people out there. So thank you for sharing. All right, Danielle. Uh, where can people find you? Where can they find the new flat rate? Give us the spiel. Please shoot me an email if you heard us on this show so that I can connect you with trade jobs. Danielle at the new flat rate.com. Of course, the website is the new flat rate.com. Uh, but also our annual conference is coming up business uncensored in October with service world expo. And I've got a promo code for you. BU 2023. That'll give you the best rate. Awesome. Danielle, thanks so much for spending your valuable time with us today and coming on the show. Hey, Josh, thanks for having me.